All right, so Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, we'll get to your question here in just a second, Mike. I want to jot these up here right quick. Preacher took some of our Thyatira. Those are the ones in chapter 3. Last week we looked at Sardis. And tonight, P-H-I. Philadelphia. So, we are on church number six, and Brother Mike, I think your question was, as far as addressing, is there were different messages to all the different churches, was this to be, though, one whole message to the whole group going through, just like they are to us today, and that is correct. So, just like Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, one is not more to us than another. But let's say there was something that you read in the book of Ephesians that applies to something that a church, an individual, a family is going through, then that is what they would need for that. Now, these, when Paul wrote it, when John wrote these, and this will be for a future time, these individual churches, just like the churches of the uh, Age of Grace, there were specific things he was writing to them for that time period. But because it was divinely inspired, God was able, and get a hold of this, God was able to address them personally, but also address an entire what you would call it, a group of people, the body of Christ right here. So as he was writing to the Ephesians and those elders um, that had all come down for that letter that gathered, that gathered there at Miletus, that was still divinely inspired that it could be directly and personally to them, but also to us and to everybody else for the last 2,000 years. All right? So... That's a good question. Just something to good to keep in mind. So as you're reading this, you understand how it is to them and how your letters are to us as well there. All right? So, Revelation chapter 3, we will jump down here to verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Hmm. Remember last week, I think it was this phrase in verse 1, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Hmm, Confucius said. Makes you kind of feel like, wow, that's, a, that's an unusual saying. You say, why would he make these statements? Now, let me help you put it together kind of put together what you see in the book of Revelation, in Hebrews uh, through Revelation there, and what you see in the gospel accounts right here. When Christ came, and we covered this a little bit, when Christ came and presented himself as the Messiah, he had who to go before him? Who did God raise up to go before and pronounce the Messiah? John the Baptist, there you go. He was the, what was that term we called him? He was the forerunner. The fore, he ran before the forerunner of Christ there. And so he comes, he gathers his 12 disciples, representing the 12 tribes of Israel that will sit upon the 12 thrones. And as time goes, he sends those disciples out in Matthew chapter 10. But then later on, you come to find out, you got these Pharisees, all these Israelites, that don't want anything to do with the Messiah. They're rejecting the Messiah. So you have the disciples go out, and they do miracles, signs, wonders, and proclaim him to be the Messiah. They miraculously can go out with no money, no extra clothing, no extra food, and they are miraculously cared for there. But as time goes, there is a rejection. And as that rejection comes about, you begin to see Christ begins to communicate with a group called the little flock, and he communicates with them by what? What method of communication did he speak to the little flock through? Parables. Matthew chapter 13, I think it has seven parables. 13 being a number of rebellion, 
but he puts those seven parables in there, and he begins to tell these stories. And only in a few of them does he explain. Like, Remember we went over the parable of the sower a few weeks back? Well, remember, he explained that. But then the rest of them, he doesn't explain all of them. And he is giving teachings and giving information in such a way to the little flock because he knows the rest of them are going to reject him. And then you get to Matthew 16, and he tells Peter and his disciples, hey, this is what's going to happen to me. I am going to be arrested, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to be resurrected. And then they rejected his message as well and did not believe on him. So Christ winds up all by himself. So, going to the cross. So, with that, you see some of these statements. You say, why does it say it that way? You've got to kind of think parable. You see, there's only a select group that's going to get it. The little flock that you see here, you're going to have a little flock over here. It's going to be just those ones that are going to believe, and the rest are not going to. They're going to fall to the Antichrist there. So with that, we'll explain this. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, that no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So we've got the key of David, and we've got this Door. There is he that openeth that no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So you got a key, you got a door. Why is he saying this to them? Well, what you have to learn as you study the book of Revelation, you really have to work hard at comparing Scripture with Scripture. And what you begin to do is you're reading through the book of Revelation, this is a way that I think now. I automatically go in my mind to whatever knowledge I have of the parables and the gospel accounts and even back into the Old Testament there. As I'm reading these things, my mind doesn't go to Romans through Philemon. It goes to places of here and here where prophecy was spoken of and the message given to these churches is for them directly as they go through this time period, but they're going to be using the rest of the Bible as well. The part of the Bible, as we talked about, that they will use very little during this time period is going to be that right there because it's going to be so different. All right? So keep that in mind as well because of those different programs. So let's start with this. It says, he that is holy, he that is true. Well, those aren't hard to figure out of the attributes of Christ. He that hath the key of David. Well, you ask yourself the question, what is the key of David? What does that make reference to? Generally, there's probably something back there in the Old Testament that we could reference and find out where it is. And so let's just go ahead and go there. I will make it easier for you tonight, and we will go straight to Isaiah chapter 22, because I've already looked it up. And we will go here to verse, uh, beginning in verse 15 here. Much of the book of Isaiah, remember this about the book of Isaiah, there's 66 chapters. There's 66 books in your Bible. There's not always a direct correlation, but there is some here and there, so keep that in mind. Just like the book of Job, 42 chapters, representing the three and a half weeks there, specifically there of the Great Tribulation. All right? So... Let's begin reading a little bit. Let's see what we can learn here. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulcher here, as he that heweth him out a sepulcher on high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock? Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. Hmm. Probably never read that before, have you? He says, Israel, I'm going to take you and I'm going to throw you like a football <laughs> somewhere. It wasn't a football. But remember, they, remember, remember this too. There are times in the Old Testament where the prophets are speaking, speaking directly to Israel and dealing with Israel in where they live, but he's also dealing with things to come as well. And that's one of the, 
the, the great things of Scripture is that God, as He writes these things and He uses man, He's able to address it in such different ways there. And then it all come to pass and all be true and there not be any contradictions. So, I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Now I'm going to give you this. This Eliakim is what we call a type of Christ. Remember, as you go through the Bible, you have the types of Christ and the types of Antichrist. People that have attributes about them that represent what Christ will be specifically in the kingdom and what the Antichrist is going to try to do. So, we'll see this, and what you can do, the next verse is going to show it to you there. I'm telling you ahead of time so you can look for it in this next verse. I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, belt. And I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father of the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Hmm. So, you read that, that's back in the book of Isaiah. We go back and we look and we just saw what we saw in Revelation chapter 3. So this Eliakim is a type of Christ because the robe, the girdle, having the key of David, having the power to open and shut and shut and open, and you say, well, what's this opening and shut, shut and open? I'll show you that in just a minute. Keep that in your head as we look at the key first. We'll get to the door in a minute, all right? So what you have right over here, it says, I will commit thy government into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of, Jer of Jerusalem, verse 21, to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. You say, why are you going to put the key on his shoulder? That seems kind of weird. It's like the government's going to be in his hand. Now, keep this right here. Let me show you a verse that you've heard before in Isaiah. All right. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Let's read the Christmas verse. All right. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his what? His shoulder. When they took, when they would yoke up the oxen, they would put the yoke upon their shoulders. When you put something on your shoulders or on your back, you're going to carry it. And uh, so that's what he's saying right there. He says, I am going to have the key. When you have a key, you have control to open and close things, and it also represents ownership. You know, when somebody gets a vehicle, you know, there, there's that kind of thing where the, there's the handing over of the keys. Here's the keys. Here's the keys to your home. Here's the keys to your apartment. Here's the keys to your vehicle. Now, if you go to jail, you don't get the keys. <laughs> all right? They don't, when you go to jail, you don't get keys, all right? They keep the keys and somebody else has got you in bondage. So when someone has the keys... They are in control. And this is what's important because a lot of peop other people, when they think of the next life, they don't think about the heavens. I was taught this in Bible college and in other churches, that you want to live right and do right so that you can be rewarded, you can receive a crown, and so that you can rule and reign with Christ upon the earth. Most Baptist churches teach that. That, you know, hey, you do right, you could be the mayor, you could be the governor. Well, that's going to be true for Israel, for the house of Judah, for that crowd. It's just what they miss is the fact that we're promised the heavens, we're going to judge angels, we get the kingdoms up there, they get the kingdom here. 
But see, this is another place where the writer is encouraging the church to say, hey, of all that's going to go on, don't worry about it. He's got the keys. His government's coming. His government is his kingdom where he will be the king and he will be in control and he is going to rule and run things. So when you see this verse at Christmas time, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government in peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. The key of David, the throne of David. Why so much emphasis on David? Remember this. When you begin to look at the government within the kingdom, you are going to have upon the earth, and I'm just going to draw the circle for the earth itself right there, you will have, you'll have Christ right here. He will be upon the throne. You will have the twelve who will have a throne. But there's going to be another throne. There's going to be that throne with in Jerusalem there. And upon that throne, who is going to be the king of Jerusalem under Christ? You know who's going to be the king? David. He's got the key. It's the key. It's the keys. It's the, it's the keys of David, the throne of David. Why so much mention about David there? Because he's going to come back and he's going to sit upon a throne there in Jerusalem and he will be the king of under Christ being the king, just like you're going to have those 12. When you look at the 12 and the 12 tribes, how they were all separated and they got all their areas of land and all those different places, if we were to put the map up, you could see that. But right there in Jerusalem, the greatest king outside of Christ himself is going to be, is going to be David right there. All right, so he's going to have that throne in Jerusalem. So that's the emphasis about David. When you talk about David and you talk about the 12 and you talk about Christ, don't get confused. They all get thrones. All right? So, so we've got that. Now, let's go back here to Revelation chapter 3. And we've got the key of David the throne of David upon his shoulders. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. Just simply saying he is in control. All right. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Now, we're going to look at the trigger word in this verse. The trigger word is the word door. That there is an open door. Where in your Bible do you hear about doors? Anything come to mind? What are some doors of the Bible? Anything come to pass? See, I don't teach y'all the Gospels that much. Y'all ain't going to know the answer. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's... There are times where I look at you guys and I realize that this is where... I'm almost glad to do it. I would much rather teach you the book of Revelation and then come back and teach you the gospel so it makes sense. First, I want you to learn Paul's writings. But see, when I start talking about doors, I know a lot about it. I, it was drilled down by the, the, the gospels. That's how you learned how to find out what would Jesus do and how to live your life and all the parables. But over in the gospel accounts, I'm going to show you some places where it talks about doors. And what most people do is they spiritualize all these parables and all these teachings and try to apply it to themselves. And they don't see it correctly. And I want to try to help you see that tonight. Let's look at several of them here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Now remember, when you get to Matthew chapter 24, you begin the Olivet Discourse. Jesus is telling the, answering the question of the disciples of the things that are going to come. Remember this... Um, Verse 3, 
If you're thinking Matthew 25, your mind needs to go back to verse 3 of, ver of chapter 24. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they're asking the questions about this time period, because that's what's coming. All right? And they believe, remember, the disciples believe they're going to be alive during that time. They have no knowledge of this right here. They believe they're going to be alive. So, over to uh, chapter 25 and verse 10. You first, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. So we know we're dealing with a parable, because that phrase likened there. But jump down here with me. It says, but while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now that's one of them. You see the reference to the door was shut. Now, we know this from Revelation. He's got the key of David. We also, what's another set of keys? Can y'all remember the, the, another set of keys mentioned in the Bible? The keys to the what? To what? Death and hell, or maybe specifically, he's got the keys of death and hell, but also to what? Yep. You went down, okay, got that as well. But there's also in the book of Revelation, I couldn't remember if I've showed you the verses, it makes reference to the bottomless pit. Remember, he's going to go down and he's going to lock up Satan at, the, um, at this point right here for those thousand years and then loose him for a season there. So you got those different references to death and hell, to lock him up, to the bottomless pit, to the kingdom there. But we got to figure out what this door is. What is this door? No man shutteth, and he openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Here we have a parable. He says, when the bridegroom came, they were ready. Some were ready, some were not. Some had their oil and had their lamps trimmed. The other ones did not there. And the door was shut. Now let's go to Luke chapter 13. Sometimes you've got to read several of them before you get the whole picture here. Luke chapter 13 and verse 23. They were asking him a question, then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter at the straight gate. Well, a gate is also called a what? It's a door, all right? For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence or I know not who you are. So once again, there is a door that has been closed. A door or a gate, yes, sir. That, that will probably tie into it as well if we back backing over there, the fact that he shut that door. Keep that thought in mind as we read these as well, as you understand what that door is and what a door represents. Whether it's to a building, <coughs> whether it's a gate going into a corral or to a city, that door or that gate represents something that is, as you saw right here, that's straight that's narrow, that's okay, you've got all of this behind it, but there's only one way that you can come in. Let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and this is where we kind of get a clearer answer. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. 
When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but when they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them, then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, let me help you, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the door, dummy. <laughs> Get it clear. He said, I'm the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So, you got all these different passages, and this one clears it up. Christ is the door. But watch this. Here's where you get real good clarity on this. He's not your door. You know why? You don't need a door. You don't need keys. Why? What are you? You are his Body. Oh. Oh. Do you know the majority of churches as they go through and teach this? What they do is they say, he's the door. He's our door. We got to go in by the, by the straight gate. And you can spiritualize it and bring it over to the teachings of Romans through Philemon and kind of make it fit. But what makes it so much clearer is when you realize these folks going through this tribulation period, and they say, okay, whose voice are you going to hear? There will be a, the voice of the Antichrist and all of his little minions there. There'll be the voice of, of Balaam and Jezebel and the things that they represent. Then there'll be the two witnesses. Then there'll be the 144,000. People will be marked on their foreheads and on their hands there. They're going to know, and they're going to lie, and they're going to have power, and they're going to offer all sorts of things. So thus, these teachings, he says, hey, of everything that's out there, this is it. You, I am the door. I have the keys to it. And when he, those parables that say, okay, for some it will be too late. Being too late is a reference to time. And remember, they only have a certain amount of time. Once it comes to the end and he comes back, the door closes. It's done. It's over for them. Now, that's true for us. If a person dies today, the quote unquote, the door is closed. But it's not really a door. It's the fact, okay, they've died and they rejected Christ. So thus, they don't get to go to heaven, they have to go to hell to pay for their sins. But for these folks, remember from last week, they got to have faith, they got to have works, they got to do it from their heart. Man, they've got to deal with all the stuff that's going on, they got to do without, they got to suffer. It's a straight and a narrow gate. He says, and I am the only way. And for him to be the door, who is he? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. His message, His instructions, what's given to these churches right here, is what they have to be so specific about. Now let me show you real quickly, there are three references to a door in Romans through Philemon. Let's see what those doors represent real quick. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Paul makes this statement. Verse 8, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. He said there's an open door for me. <coughs> you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me, of the Lord. And then finally, you go to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 3, 
with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. You go over, I think it's to Ephesians chapter 6. He prays and he says, he prays and asks that, a door, that, that, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known what is the mystery of the gospel. So of those three doors, what do you think Christ, Paul was making reference to? Yes, sir. Opportunity. Opportunity. That's it. Plain and simple. No parables. He was just talking about, hey, I have an open door. There is an opportunity for me to go through it. Sometimes people will refer to the will of God and they'll call it an open door. And that's true. For us, when God gives us opportunities, we operate today according to principles and opportunity. It's not that we have to do certain things. It's not like, okay, because this, this, this is where people get so confused. Some people say the will of God. <laughs> I mean, I went to Bible college, guys. And every other sermon in chapel was out of the Gospels and telling me about the will of God and to make sure I find the will of God and don't miss the will of God. You know why? Because they were looking at it like a small, narrow door. That if you miss that door, then you just got to do the best you can. That's not what it says. For us, Paul's like, hey, I could go here. Hey, I could go there. Hey, there's an opportunity over here. Man, wherever I can go and be most effective and do the will of God, that's what I'm going to do. And some people get so, oh, I missed the will. I think I missed the will of God in my life because I was supposed to do this one thing and I didn't do it. Man, it doesn't work like that today. For you guys today, for us today, the open door is the liberty that God gives us to follow the principles to say, okay, whatever I'm supposed to do, get after it today. If there's an opportunity, take advantage of that opportunity. Okay? But it's not something that's so narrow that you've got to be so fearful. Oh, no, I'm going to miss the will of God. If I don't pray and God doesn't tell me the right thing and I miss it, then woe is me and I'm a failure. No. There may be one opportunity one day, and there may be a different one the next. You know, there was a time that I prayed about going to be a missionary in Peru. And I had to choose between, do I stay here and do what I've been doing for 10 years, or do I go and do something else? I had two different opportunities. You say, well, did you pick the right door? I think so. Brother Mark, how did you figure out which door it was? Did you go to Pastor Payne and did he talk to God and then, he, then God talked to you and tell you what to do? No, Pastor Payne said, you know, you could stay here or go there. You'll be in the will of God either place as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do. As long as you're being obedient. As long as you're being an ambassador. He said, so how did I make the choice? How do you think I decided of whether I should go there or stay here? I did what I wanted to do. I also did this. I said, you know what? If I go to Peru, I've got to stop what I'm doing. I've got to take the time to raise the support. I've got to learn the language. I've got to get there, get the culture, get everything set up. I've got this many years of, you know, necessary evils that I've got to do just to get to a place where I can minister. And I looked where I was here. I was like, you know what? I've already got this, this, this established. You know what, it'd be easier for somebody fresh off the dock to go to Peru versus me to stop what I'm doing now and go do something else. Makes more sense for me to stay right where I'm at. Maybe make a greater emphasis about missions to the youth group and to the church and just do it here versus somebody having to figure out what I did. So I used logic and I used desire. And that's all it took. You say, did you go through the right door? No, I took advantage of the right opportunity. Well, what would happen if you went to Peru? Well, if I was still going by the book and serving God, I'd probably be speaking Spanish by now. Hopefully I'd have some stuff established. Hopefully I'd be over there and, and you know, Miss Pam would be with me over there. We'd be, that's what we'd be doing. But you know what? My desire is the further I came back home and got back into what I was doing. I said, you know, I have a greater desire to be here than I do to be over there. When I was over there, I preached and some people got saved and I realized they were going home and they didn't have a church to go to. 
And I said, man, I got to consider this. I got to pray about it. I got to think about this. You know, it's hard for me to think these people are going back and there's not a, easy for them to get to a church. And so I had to pray about that and consider it. But see, this thing about the door, you know, when you see it this way, it's like, oh, it's so clear. But for so many others, there's so much confusion about the will of God. But you look at those three verses, we didn't even have to read the whole thing. I'll guarantee several of you guys, when he said opportunity, you were like, yep, yeah, that's what I thought too. I just wasn't going to say it. But nobody went, oh, opportunity, yeah, oh. No, you didn't do that. Most of y'all got that y'all smart people. A little bit of logic, a little bit of context. But so many people, oh, it's the will of God. I can't miss it. It's in the little gate. And, if, and I, I may miss out on it. And I got to figure out the parables. And I got to figure out all this stuff that's not written to me. <laughs> Think about it. You know what people are doing? They're trying to find the will of God, taking God's words that he said to somebody else and trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. And you wonder why there are so many churches out there. That's part of it right there, all right? I am on the rabbit trail. All right, let's get, <laughs> let's get back to this real quick. We'll be done. All right, let's go back to, uh, but that's good. That's good stuff right there. Woo, all right. Uh, it's funny to watch you guys. You guys just look at me like, okay, we got this. Y'all didn't sit through all this other stuff. Brother Mike back there and Miss Deanna, Deanna and Andrew, they all back there like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And all these guys are up here like, we got it. You ain't got to be so excited. Just go on with yourself. <laughs> you know, eventually, we'd like to get through this. Go on. Okay, but that's okay. Good. We, good job, guys. All right. Revelation chapter 3. <laughs> and uh, let's get down here to verse... Um, he talks about denying their name. Verse 8, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now, when we get into, when we get over to the section in the book of Revelation, where it talks about, and I'm going to give you some probable ways and things from Scripture that show you probably what the mark of the beast really is. I mean, it tells us you got the 666 number there. But there's some other things that go along with it. You know, there was this big fad that went about that it was supposed to be a microchip because people wouldn't be able to buy and sell. And because, you know, all these bar people got, there was, people got scared of barcodes and scanning tools inside of grocery stores because they were afraid. Of people were like, ah, oh, they're putting microchips in the dogs. What are we going to do? Well, you're going to find your dog. That's what you're going to do if you lose your dog. But they were thinking, oh, this is the beginning. This is what's going to happen there. But let me do tell you this. There will be something with denying who Christ is in order for them to give their allegiance to the Antichrist. We'll see some of the elements of Baal worship, some of the things that go on in denominational churches today. But that denying his name is more than just saying, well, okay, I'm just denying Christ. Yes, sir. Good question. He asked this question. And see, I'm, I'm going to get some props right here because I actually remember to repeat your question, all right? Because the people listening always fuss because all of a sudden it gets quiet. And then I start talking about something they have no idea what it is. And then uh, they would throw things at me, but they can't get it through the, through the thing. But the question is, once a person takes the mark of the beast, meant, I mean, do they become like a, like a zombie? And do they not know what they're doing? I don't think it's quite that way. I think if a person takes the mark of the beast, there probably wouldn't be a transformation it would be some, if they've gotten to the place where they're willing to do it, they're duped anyway. And really, I think what you can do, I'm going to come to you right quick, because I'm going to lose this if I'm not careful. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, um, he's teaching back and forth between the rapture and the second coming, trying to show the church at Thessalonica the difference there. He says, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letters from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That day is making reference to the Antichrist, that you're over in the tribulation period there. 
who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The abomination of desolation in Daniel that we'll look at down the road. These people that are doing it will believe it wholeheartedly. The same way that they, they can go to Mass and believe that they are partaking of the blood and body of Christ, it becomes it inside of them, and they start kissing hands and putting ashes on their forehead and all that other stuff, those people believe it. So they're not just going to be, they will be duped, but it will be little by little by the power of religion and Baal worship and the lust of the flesh that's going on there. So, Zach, what was your question, bro? Will the mark be, um, will you have to have the mark to buy everything or necessities? I, will, I believe it will be everything. That's why he's going to have to provide that manna that we talked about during that time. They're going to be taken off and sheltered. you got evangelism and evasion. So it's not like they're just wandering through the streets trying to get by. They're at a place like they were in the wilderness. God had them right where he wanted them on their way to where they were supposed to be and provided for them there. Okay, what do you mean? Um, I don't think anyone will be forced to because it's not just them coming up and poof, okay, we got you. Slap a tattoo on you, stick a chip in you. You know, the people that take the mark of the beast are going to willingly do it. They're going to look and they're going to get sucked into the religious system, into the flesh there. And then there's going to be that fear of the repercussions. They're going to see the people get beheaded and all that business. So it's that whole process is going to go on. But will there be clarity of the miracles and the signs and wonders? It'll be just, as you read the gospel accounts, when Christ came and Lazarus got up from the dead, they still rejected him. I mean, what, what more do they want? You know, they part, God parted the Red Sea. And yet they said, no, we're still going to go across there and kill them. That's how dumb they were. It's like, for, do you see? Do you see? <laughs> and they still did it. And that's just like there'll be people that go through the tribulation period. And as we go through and see all the vials and everything that's dumped out, they're still not going to. There'll be those who still won't believe, who will still deny Christ and deny his message during that time. So, everybody, I believe, just like people have opportunity today, they will have opportunity during that time as well there. So, let me read you this passage right quick. Anybody else have anything right quick? I don't want to interrupt you. I'll read this and we'll be done um, about denying his name. Let's go to Revelation 13 and verse 15 here. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. We're, we're up here in this time period now where... You've got the, uh, the two witnesses are gone, but then he's going to, um, let me read it to you. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast. The beast will take that deadly wound, is going to come back to life. The image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Remember, there's going to be the beast and an image. Remember the story with, um, from the Old Testament with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They built that big old thing of gold, and everybody had to come and bow down and worship it. Well, during this time, this thing's going to be able to talk. <laughs> it's going to have power. It's going to not just be just a gold idol. It's going to be an idol that can talk and have power there. We'll get to that as we get to that section there. And it says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark and the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there is that thing in the context where you see in verse 16, you see the literal taking of the mark. But in verse 15, you'll see the power that's going to impress everybody and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, they should be killed. So... This not just taking the mark, there will be an act of worship to the image and to the Antichrist, the beast himself there. 
So when we get to 12 and 13, there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on in about this 30-day period here. All right? But we go ahead so that we can kind of understand a little bit better of why he is saying what he is saying here in chapter, chapter 3 to the church at Philadelphia. You've got a little strength, you've kept my word, and you have not denied my name. So the denying of his name during the tribulation period is part of that process of taking the mark of the beast. It's more than just taking a mark. It's an act of worship. It's a kneeling down. It's, uh, it's probably got, we'll see where it has to do with a kiss as well. All right, so, all right, we are out of time. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we are thankful, Lord, for what you allow us to see. Lord, I appreciate our young people.